Okay, so my goal is to get you out of here be before 12.15, or at least by 12.15. So this is the second lecture that has to do with using lasers in shock tubes. And I was telling you about the state of the art of shock tube ideas. So, but now we're gonna go back to be using, using lasers uh, to measure species. So we'd like to measure generally species versus time, which means we need to know temperature because temperature tells us the spectroscopy that we need to interpret our absorption signals quantitatively. So I'm gonna give you a bit of an overview here. So, let's see what I got here. So I'm gonna do laser absorption theory, and uh, we've already spent time on the, on the uh, lambert beer law or the Beer-Lambert law. Uh, we've looked at the configuration that we most often use, which is typically one to two centimeters from the end wall. We typically will measure a reference intensity I zero here, and then propagate through to measure I, and we'll take the ratio, accounting for any window losses that are constant. So if we have a small molecule, we use this form of the uh, spectral absorption coefficient, line strength, line shape. So that would mean we need to know both. We know the temperature, and we have a good database, we know the line strength of that species for the wavelength or line we're studying. We may have to study this in order to determine the line shape function, but we treat those as known before we proceed. Remember, we might have a line that looks like this, and so we would do some experiments to measure the collision, broaden, collision broadening, and we would have that database available. You could not rely on HITRAN for that because it doesn't have high temperature broadening information. So let me look, just show you some of the species we've measured over time. I've been doing this now 30 plus years, maybe 40 years. So we've gradually learned how to measure in the UV, the visible, the infrared. We're increasingly using the infrared as lasers have become available there. Uh, but you can see that we have to, for given species, we have to identify the optimum wavelength. We have to do the spectroscopy to make it quantitative, and then we proceed. Uh, the first time we did this with a tunable dye laser, 1982, yeah, 30, 33 years ago, uh, we're still using this laser, actually. This is a ring dye laser. So there's a sort of a pump laser, which excites the dye, and then the radiation from the laser propagates in the cavity, and we can control the wavelength and tune it. So that's a, a typical uh, tunable, single frequency, monochromatic dye laser. So it's, it's a CW laser. Uh, and we might use that in the ultraviolet. Uh, in the visible, we would use different types of, we might still use the dye laser, but without frequency doubling in the infrared, we use generally tunable diode lasers. Uh, we have available now this expensive laser I told you about last hour, Mira. Uh, this is a Thai sapphire laser. So that means instead of a liquid dye, it's a it's a tie sapphire crystal. It's still pumped, and so typically in a laser you have a pump laser which causes something which you can adjust the wavelength. In this case you can adjust the wavelength, but it's not in the UV, so then you frequency double or quadruple, and you end up with tunable light in the wavelength ranges you want. So this laser is uh, 80 megahertz, so it's, it's kind of like it's on all the time, but it's actually pulses of light two picoseconds long at 80 megahertz. Now, frequently we'll use now uh, tunable diode lasers. This was, the, uh, this was a um, laser we bought from a company called NovaWave, which is the one we use to do difference, difference frequency generation. So these lasers come in different, uh, different vendors. And the question is, uh, you might say, is how sensitive are our absorption diagnostics? This is a plot we made up of the detection uh, sensitivity, minimum detectable parts per million of these species versus temperature for a path length of 15 centimeters of pressure, one atmosphere, and one megahertz. So why do I care about the frequency? Because the noise goes up with frequency. So if you quadruple this uh, frequency, you will have twice the white noise. Path length, so we care about the path length. So we need the path length, the uh, noise component of, that comes with frequency, and we need the pressure. Why do we need the pressure? because the pressure together with the temperature determines the broadening coefficient and the line shape. So basically the detection limit goes up with temperature because the fractional population in the state has gone down. But still you can see that uh, for these big molecules, we're in the range of say um, 100 parts per million here. Methyl is a electronic transition. Okay, these would be infrared transitions that are not as strong as the UV transitions. The UV transitions are down here, 
and we get a few parts per million. Now we can also go to uh, reactive radicals. And so here if we did CN, I think I told you that the oscillator shrink for CN is amazingly big. We can actually detect uh, 10 parts per billion and so on, CH, OH, and CO. So if you, depending on the molecule, the detection limit changes because of the oscillator strength. So these numbers are uh, quite appealing. Subparts per million for the reactive, ra so the reactive radicals, and that means we're doing electronic transitions. Electronic transitions have bigger oscillator strength than the infrared transitions. So that's why, and fortunately, uh, we need this because these concentrations of these reactive radicals are quite a bit smaller. So a good experiment is one in which you design to answer some question. You have to find the sweet spot. And so the, what we have to design is, well, temperature, pressure, mixture, and the things we measure. And if you want to study chemistry, you usually want to have the high, most highest dilution you can have, which means small concentrations of the reactive species, which then has to be compatible with your measurement uh, detection limit. So you have to design the experiment. And I'll just show you some examples. Here's, some, here's our high pressure shock tube. Uh, here's one of our extended uh, test time shock tubes. Uh, this is a historic shock tube that I did my uh, postdoc work on a long time ago. It's still available. It's, it's much fancier now than it was in those days. Uh, I'm going to show you examples now from what I'll call foundation fuel uh, kinetics. So uh, this is a specific elementary reaction. I'm going to then show you some specific hydrocarbon molecules, such as methyl ester. And I'll show you some how we deal with the fact that uh, there's a certain problem that I'm going to deal with when we get to the butanol isomer. So uh, we looked at these. Uh, we've looked, we try to look at ele in elementary reactions. That is, we try to look at an individual reaction. The gold experiment is one in which you study something and you measure a direct determination of the rate coefficient without ambiguity. They're the hardest to find because uh, usually you have a mixture of species and a mixture of reactions taking place. These are examples of elementary reactions that we have studied at different times over the last uh, 20, 30 years. And which, so once you determine the rate coefficient with temperature, it's done. It's quite a bit like measuring thermodynamic properties. Once it's done, it's done. And uh, you put your time in on the ones that are the next most important over time. Here's two examples that I'm going to show you. This one here, which is the, the, the chain branching reaction that's so important. So how do we measure these individual reaction rates? Uh, it's kind of a two-step process. We design the experiments. So you, you uh, have sensitivity analysis in a chemical code, a chemkin code, and you play with temperature, pressure, mixture, and the thing you're going to measure, knowing how well you can measure over some range. And you try to find, through sensitivity analysis, how to do the best job possible to isolate the reaction you care about. We use the shock tube as the mechanism for step heating, and, and then we use laser absorption for the species detection. And I'm going to show you this example. This is this is a, a big success story over a lot of time, over 30 years. We've done this now. More recent, most recently, we've done this by measuring water at 2.55. You might say there's no water in this reaction. That's okay. We have found a trick. We found a trick. So we, we find that if we uh, use sensitivity analysis, and uh, here's an example at 1,400 Kelvin, one at 20 in atmospheres, and if we use 0.1% oxygen, 0.9% hydrogen, 9 to 1 here, and now we do sensitivity analysis, which is a, an analysis of what is the sensitivity uh, of, of a particular species, in this case water, to a specific reaction in this mixture. So behind the scenes is a survey over temperature, pressure, mixture space, trying to find a place where we can measure something which is primarily sensitive to a reaction we care about. And it's very insensitive to these competing reactions. So in this mixture, at these conditions, and assuming the mechanism is correct, a measurement of water is a very sensitive way of getting this rate coefficient uh, over this period of time relative to the interfering reactions. So you combine uh, your experimental capabilities with sensitivity analysis to, to plan the experiment. So here's an experiment that the student did uh, in 2010 uh, in this mixture. So this is a plot of water, mole fraction in parts per million. Here's the data. 
and this green is the simulation with the best fit value of the rate coefficient here. And so also shown are the, best, are the fits with a 30% modification of that rate coefficient. So what you can see is that it's uh, consistent with simulation and that it's, it's more sensitive than the 30% change in the rate coefficient. So if, if, if we think we're, if we're confident that this is being done correctly, we've just determined this rate coefficient to maybe, maybe 5% which would be better than it's ever been determined before. So that's kind of funny. And you have to ask, well, how did we do that? Well, in this mixture, it, once this reaction proceeds, uh, and with this extra hydrogen, the formation of water follows in, kind of in a direct way uh, with this reaction. So if we plot these data, um, I, I had one student who did this uh, back around 1990, and he got these results right here. OK, first of all, with rate coefficients, you use an Arrhenius diagram. You plot on a semi-log plot the rate coefficient versus 1 over t. And here's his data in blue by measuring OH. So he actually measured OH directly. And then we had this new idea for measuring water, and we get the red points. And that's a new student uh, 20 years later. The open symbols are the work of another uh, person back around 1990 using a different method. And so what you see is the scatter in the laser data is quite a bit better in the scatter by this other method known as atomic resonance absorption spectroscopy, or ARIS. So the laser, because of the constant, the constant power, monochromatic nature, we get much higher quality data than uh, these other methods. And they, these two measurements agree, and we would say that that rate coefficient is now known to perhaps um, uh, 5%, say, which would be maybe 5-7%. Maybe so the point is that modern laser methods taken together with the shock tube reduce the uncertainty in this quantity that's so important in combustion modeling. Now I'm going to give another example. Um, Professor Hai Wang came to me and said that uh, this reaction was very important in modeling flame speeds. So he was doing some modeling of uh, laminar flame speeds. And uh, I don't know whose experiments he was modeling. And he said that the uncertainty in this rate coefficient uh, was now becoming perhaps the dominant uncertainty in his modeling. And so we wanted to find a way to measure this uh, reaction. And we would like to make it as direct as we can. And we wanted to do, and we used a trick which is called pseudo first order, which is, uh, which will become apparent here in a minute. And we're gonna do this um, using a, a technique called TBHP. So this is tert butyl hydroperoxide. This is a chemical which when it's raised to a temperature in this range, kind of instantly gives you an OH molecule. So the idea is that you would use this trick. You would have a tracer of TBHP in your mixture with, uh, with um, uh, hydrogen. So you would, at time zero, essentially produce OH, which would react with high. So you can't buy a bottle of OH. That's the problem. You'd like to have a bottle of OH, put it together with H2, and watch what happens. But you can't do that. So how do you get OH? Well, you use this trick. And the trick works in this temperature range of about 500 degrees. This method was first done by, uh, by Botten Cohen and has also been used at Argonne National Laboratory, but now we're using it. And the basic idea is that this molecule is called tert butyl hydroperoxide. It's structured so that there's an OH dangling here together with this uh, other molecule that's fairly stable. And so when we heat it, this bond breaks, and we have this residual molecule plus a little bit of um, methyl and some OH. And so in our kinetic modeling, we will account for the fact that these things are present. But for the most part, we design experiments so that it's only the OH that's reacting. So what we do is we, we start with um, an excess of hydrogen. So we have maybe uh, 25 parts per million of OH produced by TBHP, 26. So what happens to the OH? It wants to react only with the hydrogen, but the hydrogen is nearly constant. And so by monitoring the decay rate of OH, you get essentially an exponential process. That's called a pseudo first order reaction rate experiment. And it's designed so that you don't actually have to have an accurate calibration of OH, you only measure essentially the characteristic time of this exponential decay. And when you do that, you get a particular number. So that's like the gold, almost a gold experiment. There's uh, essentially mostly just one reaction that's important. We, this does not rely on highly accurate uh, absorption uh, cross-section for OH because it's only the decay time that we care about. 
So that's, that's a pretty good experiment. And uh, we can do this with high sensitivity. So we're, our detection limit here is probably of the order of about, about one part per million. So you design the experiment so that you have enough OH but not too much OH because more OH triggers other chemical reactions that get in the way. We think also we do this to about 3 to 5%. So here's the data points, and uh, here's the so-called best fit to the data points for that rate coefficient. I don't know if I have a... We think now if we combine all the uncertainties that it's probably good to about 17%, and that's when we put our data, which are in the black symbols, on this plot. So Professor Wong was looking at this mess, trying to decide how to fit that. And uh, he wanted to get a, a, reduce the uncertainty. <clears throat> so we did our job. We, we reduced the uncertainty <clears throat> of this rate coefficient up to about 1,500 Kelvin. So the laser being uh, uh, precise in wavelength, steady in intensity, just yields more accurate measurements than some of the other methods. Let's see here. Michael and Sutherland. They used atomic resonance. They used ARES techniques, methods. Let's see, Davidson is also was in my laboratory. Let's see, that's uh, these symbols up in here that we did some years ago. So basically, oops, I want to go here. Okay, so that's just, uh, those were two examples of the kind of the gold standard, direct determinations of rate coefficients. So there's ignition delay time, which depends upon lots of reactions. But they're, but they're modeled using detailed mechanisms with specific rate. Where do you get the rate coefficients? You can get them from different kinds of experiments, but the best experiment is one like this. So if you're above a temperature of, say, 1,200 degrees Kelvin, you really can't use flow reactors anymore, so you're, we're kind of in the shock tube domain. Shock tube is the precise way of doing this at high temperatures. Of course, we're trying to now push down to go to low temperatures as well. I want to give you another example and um, what are called methyl esters. So these are fuels which are, which are relevant to biofuels. And uh, these methyl esters, um, they have different names. I think I'm going to show you the structure of these in a minute. And, and the reaction of OH with these um, fuels turns out to be one of the important steps in modeling combustion of these fuels. Because this OH comes along and it grabs off some radical from that. So if you do detailed modeling, you find out that the OH abstraction reactions, they're called, from these different fuels uh, are, are key. Now, sometimes we'll also study methylformate pyrolysis. I'll talk about that, too. If we were to do pyrolysis of these species, we would be imagining that we're going to form uh, a variety of possible species. And so we've developed methods of measuring these species, and I'm going to show you that. So, if we want to study these reactions, we can use the same trick that, we just, that I just showed you with TBHP. So we put in TGHP, TBHP in an excess of methyl formate, and we watch the OH go away, and we determine that elementary rate coefficient. And we can do that for these different uh, uh, structure, different uh, sizes of the, of the methyl esters and see how the overall rate coefficient depends upon the number of bonds and so on. So here's the species shown structurally. Methyl formate is the simplest. Uh, this is an ester here. This is an ester. This, so this is methyl. It's on the end of all of them. So hence the name methyl esters. So what varies is what's on the other end. So whether it's an H, which means it's a formate, acetate, propanoate, and so on. So it's the same methyl ester structure with different m molecules on the end. And the question is, how does the rate coefficient uh, vary with those things. And here's the results. So if we plot the rate coefficient measured from these uh, first order reaction experiments, uh, you would find, let's see, what do we have? We have the uh, um, acetate is here, formate is here, propanoate. So generally, when the molecule gets bigger, this way, it becomes more reactive. So this rate coefficient is bigger than this one, is bigger than this one. The exception is this one with, methyl, with the H. It's kind of anomalously bigger. You might think that the black should be down here, but there's a reason why it's up here. So this is, becomes a really good test for current uh, theorists. But interestingly enough, there's a simple model presented by, I think, a fellow named Atkinson. It's called the Structural Additivity Reaction Rate Method, which just looks at the structure of the molecules and tries to predict what the rate coefficients would be. 
we took that simple model, which was probably been out for 10 or 20 years, and we just take his numbers and multiply by 0.75, it's amazingly consistent with our experiments. So that's like the simplest level of theory that explains this, uh, the uh, change in the rate coefficient with structure. So that you really need good experiments to make these, uh, to resolve these differences in theory. We think that these are good to better than 25%. And so now let me show you this one case here. This would be the, um, the formate case, as a formate. Here's our results, which we think are better than 25%. This is the result of a theoretical study at Princeton, by chance, actually. And it just reflects that, in fact, in 2012, the theory still had a pretty big problem in trying to get agreement with the experiments. Generally, the discrepancy gets worse as the temperature gets lower. So, you know, experiment and theory go hand in hand. You need the theory to design your experiments. You use the experiments to refine the theory. You go back and forth. There's advantages to both. But this is a reflection of the fact that a good experiment is still better than even a current theory. It's comp the theory is complicated. Okay. Methyl ester kinetics. I want to show you another example now. And this, now what I want to do is project the, the benefit of measuring multiple quantities. So the gold experiment is one in which you have only one reaction that's important and you measure it directly. The next best thing is to look at a complicated molecule and measure many things. And so here's an example of where we're at uh, 1400 Kelvin in this methyl formate argon. So this is a pyrolysis experiment. And here's the methyl formate. We measure how it goes away with time. We measure how the carbon monoxide and the methanol go up with time. We find the time at which they begin to differ. We measure also the formation of formaldehyde and methane and CO2. So the idea is that we're going to measure enough things that we can test the model more rigorously. And we can see whether or not we're tracking all the species. So if we add up the, at a particular time of 300 microseconds, if we add up the measurements that we make, we account for over 98% of the oxygen. So that means it gives us confidence. We haven't made a big mistake. We haven't left out something really big. So that means that you've taken a, a more complicated molecule and you're trying to sort out how does it come apart by looking at multiple channels. What we learn is that at short times, the initial reaction is dominated by the immediate formation of uh, methanol and CO. So basically, you, you somehow break off CO and you're left with the rest, and they're equal. And then at longer times, somehow the, this is methanol, it begins to go flat. So obviously the methanol is beginning to decompose to something else. And that's maybe how we get down to these other species. So these multi-species time histories are very valuable. It's kind of the emerging type of data that we do. What, what is, how, how is this enabled? By being able to measure multiple species in the shock tube environment. So we have to bring together laser diagnostics and the shock tube environment to do a better job of chemistry. I'm going to show butanol is a fuel that's of some interest for biofuels. We had a program, Sanford was part of a program, actually based at Princeton, like uh, the Energy Frontier Research Center, in which one of the uh, goals was to study the details of butanol. This is the butanol molecule here. <clears throat> and we wanted to study both the pyrolysis and the oxidation. And so we're going to do this by measuring multiple time histories again. Now, actually, butanol comes in four different um, forms. And one of them is called tert butanol, a different uh, isomers, form, isomers formed. One of those four is tert butanol, where these, you have these three methyl groups and then the OH hanging off to the side. This is a contrast with the, the normal butanol in which the OH is on the end. So there's two forms of butanol there, and the rate coefficients are going to be different for those two cases. Now the challenge with this one is we'd like to measure the removal of OH the way we just showed you. Put in OH with an excess of the tert butanol, watch the OH decay, and you think you're going to get the rate coefficient for the pseudo first order decay. But there's one problem. If it's an oxygenated species, Maybe it breaks and it produces some competing OH, and that, that, so that complicates things. That means when you react, not only are you removing some H's, but you're also re releasing some OH, and that confuses your experiment. So we had to deal with that problem, and we came up with a solution that uh, 
I thought we were first, but we were not actually the very first to do isotopic labeling. I believe they did it first at Argonne. So the challenge is that there's multiple reaction sites. And I'm going to show you how we use isotopic labeling. It's very expensive. We had to buy this stuff. It cost like $7,000 to buy a small sample of this stuff, terbutanol. So you can buy, if you, if you use regular terbutanol, that would be oxygen-16. The labeled terbutanol is going to be oxygen-18. Is the absorption spectrum of, of OH with a 16 the same as the spectrum for 18? Not exactly. So that that means is that we can tune our laser to be coincident with a line of oxygen of OH with 16, or we could tune it to be coincident with the center of a line for oxygen or OH oxygen 18. So we, have, we can discriminate. And uh, so that's what we did. But this is what happens if you have uh, this terbutanol that's labeled this way, where that is with an oxygen 16 in the fuel. And I'm going to show you what happens when we use the sample that cost us $7,000. Um, and I was really worried about this. I'm afraid, what if it doesn't work? But if you, if you start with this, what happens is the, it can react in two different ways. You can react here and produce a structure, or you can react this way. So we won't go into the details. The fact is there's multiple ways that this is, can react. The fact is the OH can react in different places. It can react with one of these methyl groups, or it can react with this OH. And so what, and you have two different paths. It can go this way, or it can go down this way. But if it reacts with one of these methyl groups, then there's the question about what's the brand, what fraction goes this way, what fraction goes this way. The fraction that goes this way then has another chance and eventually comes down and it produces, um, and produces an OH. And the question is, so there's an OH that's the oxygen 16. So there's some confusion because this replaces the, oxy, the OH that you started with. So you start with some OH, and, and if you take this path right here, you're going to recover an OH. And so in the end, what counts is what fraction goes this way and what fraction goes this way, and it's, um, it's hard to sort out. So um, that's called OH reformation, and that's a, so that's a problem. That means when we measure only one thing, OH going away, it's, con it's uh, confused by the fact that some of the reaction replaces the OH that we started with. So what can we do? We can, we can have this, uh, this um, tert-butyl made with O18 uh, for some amount of money. And so you, you do this, and now this channel, uh, where you, this is the oxygen 18. This is the one that comes off. So in this case, the OH that's formed by this uh, path is different than the one we're measuring. We measure the O16. So that means we have removed that problem, and we can keep track, we can infer then the relative paths of these two things. So in fact, what we do is we measure, <coughs> we measure the time history is this the O16 or the O18? I can't tell. Uh, so we fit the decay and we get the rate coefficient. And uh, that's the slow removal. OK, that's the O16 case. Now if we do the O18 case, what's the difference? This is the one that's labeled so that it does not replace the OH that we're removing. So it goes away faster. So if we, if we look at this, that's the, rate, the net rate. But this is the rate of the reaction we care about. And this one includes the reformation. So if you interpret that the wrong way, you think that's the rate coefficient. This is the rate coefficient. So by using two isotopes and, and the diagnostic that's centered only on one of those two, you can actually figure this out. And so you can sort out the branching uh, this way. So the details aren't so important. It's the strategy. It's, it's um, single species detection with isotopic labeling. We could have also tried to measure the oxygen 18 OH, but we didn't do that. What we did do is we made sure that the oxygen 18 line in OH was separated so that our measurement was only that of the oxygen 16. So we can sort this out. We can, do, uh, we can sort this out, and we can get the total rate coefficient, and we get the branching that goes one way. And, and we can compare this with the state of the art, which was the theory from Serathi. Actually, it's not theory, it's data fits. So these were really the best data that have ever been found for this particular problem. And you could, you could be off by quite a factor if you didn't interpret these experiments properly. So that's the power of narrow, narrow line width 
laser spectroscopy, and isotopic labeling. And we can get the branching ratio. So the chemists would say, well, what's the branching ratio? Which fraction goes one way, which fraction goes the other way? We could figure all that out, which was uh, unique. OK. Well, that's fine. So we use OH quite a bit. But we're interested always in finding new species. And so one of the things we've tried to do is figure out a way to measure formaldehyde, and this is acid aldehyde. The aldehydes are important when you burn hydrocarbon fuels at low temperatures. So you'll want to, they always produce some, uh, some aldehydes. And we'd like to measure those as we go into the NTC region. We're also very interested in, in uh, some of the alkenes. These are the alkynes, that's like acetylene. And I want to tell you about this new trick we've got that allows us to make measurements that are much more sensitive than before. So an aldehyde. The problem with these aldehydes is that they have overlapping spectra. So there's formaldehyde. And whenever you have formaldehyde, the spectra overlaps with the acid aldehyde. So how do you know which one you're measuring? Usually when you have that problem, you use multiple wavelengths. So you look at the infrared absorption spectrum that com combines these two species at, um, see the acid aldehyde looks like it was at, I can't read that, I think that's the acid aldehyde at 300. So we have to use the FTIR and sometimes we have to do that at room temperature. So the point is there's formaldehyde and acid aldehyde in this, in this infrared. And, and then in the UV, they also overlap. But the small molecule formaldehyde has a discrete structure, whereas the acid aldehyde, being a big molecule, has more or less a continuum structure. So we can take advantage of this, and we pick colors. So we'll use a color that's on the peak of this formaldehyde line, as well as one that's just on the edge, where formaldehyde is low, and the acid aldehyde is nearly the same. And then we go into the UV and we pick one here, which is uh, dominated by acid aldehyde. So basically, we use three wavelengths to sort out two species and uh, figure that out. So we can we check ourselves by doing experiments in what's called trioxane. And trioxane is a molecule which gives us three formaldehydes. And we do this in a mixture of trioxane and acid aldehyde to convince ourselves that we know how to sort these species out. So we would do an experiment of the absorption versus time at three colors. Looks like we might have actually used four colors in this case. So these, these would be the infrared ones. These are the UV ones. And these are reflected shock experiments. And what we do is we wait until the reactions have stopped. And we sort out these numbers, and we convince ourselves, are we able to measure the species um, correctly? And this is a summary plot that shows that we can measure the formaldehyde. That's in the blue. It goes up to the value. So if you start with 0.17% uh, of trioxane, you should end up with three times that. You should end up with 0.5% of uh, formaldehyde. And if you do this with 0.5% acid aldehyde, it won't change in this experiment that's only 965 degrees. So basically, we convince ourselves that our three or four color strategy is sufficient to sort out the overlapping spectra between these two species. So when the molecules are small, it's usually pretty simple. But when the molecules get big, uh, life gets more complicated. Now, we're also interested in um, alkenes. So what we've learned is that if you take uh, hydrocarbon fuels, and we have a program now to study jet fuels. So if you take a jet fuel and you heat it to some high temperatures, that large hydrocarbon wants to become small hydrocarbons. And we find that we, a lot of them want to become alkenes. So that the dominant one is ethylene. And then we have propene and uh, isobutene. So this is the absorption spectrum of these relevant, I think this is called allyl. This is the absorption spectrum of, of uh, the overlapping spectra of these species. So I call this hydrocarbon soup. If you start with a big molecule and you decompose it and you form these things, you'll have overlapping spectra. So the question is, how do you ever figure out how to measure them individually? Well, you start here and you try to figure out where you think you should be. And then you go into the shock tube and you measure cross sections of all the species and you and you try to figure out if you've got a multi-wavelength strategy that will work. But isobutene, that's this one here, 
is a, a good example of what we'd like to do. So uh, we began to work with 11 micron laser. Uh, here's our isobutene up here, isooctane pyrolysis, isooctane. When isooctane decomposes, it forms isobutene. So at 1100 degrees, this is the isobutene forming, and at 1100 degrees, this is slower. So it's faster at high temperature, of course. So what we've convinced ourselves is that we can measure isobutene in the pyrolysis of isooctane and determine rate coefficients that are relevant to modeling real fuels. But it's, it's hard when there are multiple paths, multiple species, and uh, if we ask, well, how good are the models? If we took the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory model, it's actually not that bad. Although it seems to be high on the low temperatures and low on the high temperatures. So again, the experiments, if done properly, are usually the, uh, the way that people improve their models. OK, what about acetylene? We, we became interested in acetylene because acetylene is a precursor to soot formation. So we wanted to study acetylene, and we began to do this in the infrared at three microns. There's the peak. So you go to, uh, here's, OK, we used Hytran. So acetylene is a small enough molecule that's in Hytran. You can go into Hytran, and you can compute what the absorption spectrum should look like, subject to some issues about a line broadening. And you can say, well, that's the wavelength I should use. Well, the trouble is this is a blended feature, and so when you really think about it, the peak of that feature may change with temperature. So it's not quite so obvious that that's the optimum wavelength. But in any case, we can, we can do this. So we went into propene, and we did pyrolysis experiments in which we convert that propene into acetylene, and we can measure the time history. So you can begin to see how we would use time histories to determine the rate coefficients of pyrolysis as the hy big hydrocarbons become smaller. This is the JetSurf 2.0 model from USC, and you can see that there's a big discrepancy here. The initial slope isn't too bad. Probably what's happening here is that there's some additional reactions that are, that are, um, that are um, in this, there's some missing reactions in the JetSurf model because it ought to roll over like this. So again, experiments in theory and simulations go hand in hand. We took the model that came from uh, Aramco from Saudi Arabia. It's really quite different. That's interesting. That shows you at today, in this period of time, how different these detailed models are in different laboratories. The USC model and the Aramco model are really quite different. And they're both a little different from the experiment. So uh, what happens is you make comparisons and you gradually um, make advances. OK, I think this was uh, maybe the first detection of acetylene first detection of acetylene uh, in pyrolysis. And so, and it's important because we're gonna anticipate studying soot formation. Okay, now we wanna show you, because I have a few, only a few more minutes here, I wanna show you how we can do even better. This idea is called cavity enhanced absorption spectroscopy. So right now we, we define L as the path length across our reactor. And that would be the diameter of the shock tube. And if you want to get multiple paths, you usually bounce the light back and forth, and you use what's a white cell or a Harriot cell, in which the light comes in a hole in this mirror, and this is a reflective mirror, and the light bounces back and forth, and it goes out another hole. The trouble with that is that because of beam steering, some of the light doesn't get out the hole. And so you end up being limited as to how many paths you can make in a shock tube. And typically, five, six, seven is about all you can do and still get light out the hole. But there's a trick. And, and the idea wasn't mine, but the application to the shock tube is mine. And that is that, well, replace these uh, reflective mirrors, which have a hole and an exit hole, replace them with exit mirrors that are highly reflective, but not perfectly reflective. Instead of being as highly reflective as you can make them, let's make them just 0.99. That means that when the light comes over here, and if there's no loss in the, in the mirror, 1% of the light goes out. Then it goes over here and it comes back and 1% of the light goes out. So the light that gets to the detector has passed through the, sh the shock tube multiple times. Some of it one time, some of it three passes, some of it five. And so, and, but because you're taking the light out everywhere, you can focus it onto the detector without this problem of being steering. Each one of these paths is designed so that it kind of traces out an ellipse. And that's because you don't want these beams to overlap 
because it introduces a certain type of cavity noise. So this idea, um, okay, increases the effective path to length to an effective length that's given by this simple equation. The effective length over the original diameter goes scales as r over one minus r, or r's reflectivity nearly one. So it's basically one over one minus r. And if you make this r 0.99, you get a factor of 100 gain. Now there's nothing's always easy, but that's a, a concept that avoids the problems of beam steering to do multipath. And we use this concept of coming, we come in at an angle, we call it off axis insertion. And it traces out this uh, ellipse. And so uh, it works amazingly well. So we've just done this fairly recently. Th uh, we did this first with um, acetylene, then we did methane, and now we do CO. And now we're doing this in CO on the fundamental band. Here's a plot of the detection limits in ppm versus 1 minus r. So if, um, if r is 0.99, and the temperature is 1,500, that means our detection limit is around 0.3 parts per million. That's amazing. Well, it's 100 times better than what we were doing if we don't have any increased noise. Is this technique the same as cavity ring down? Control? Good question. Most people use highly reflective mirrors, and they send in a pulse of light, and they watch the decay time of that pulse. That's called cavity ring down. Very powerful idea. In that method, the higher the reflectivity, the, the greater the effective length. So you're, they achieve increased lengths that way. But they measure the decay time of a pulse. In my method, we do it in real time. So it's like they both are highly reflective cavities. And in their case, they want the highest reflection they can get. They'll get four nines. We don't want four nines because we actually have to let some light out. So it's, so it's like a variation of, uh, it's, it's cavity enhanced absorption. Cavity ring down is one way to do it. Uh, our way of continuous uh, detection is an alternate. Now we weren't the first to do uh, uh, continuous wave detection, but the difference is most everybody wants 0.9999. I don't want point, I, I, we don't want the reflectivity to be so high that the light spends too long in the cavity because it degrades my time resolution. So this is basically called low finesse cavity enhanced absorption spectroscopy done in the shock table. What's unique is we, gam we took the gamble. We took the gamble and said, let's put the mirrors right on the shock table. Let's see if they get dirty. Let's make the, point, the R.99 and we're not gonna worry about it quite so much. If you go to point 0.9999, you're always going to worry about them getting dirty. So it's low finesse. Off axis has to do with the alignment. So it's, it's, uh, it's not completely novel, but it's the very first time it's been done in the shock tube. And so with this, we get a huge gain. We're getting sub-PPM detection. So basically, we got a gain of, uh, I think in the laboratory, we demonstrated a gain of 82. So you don't get a gain of 82 very often in an experiment. So, and you can use, we haven't tried this yet because these mirrors are kind of expensive and you have to wait a long time. So we'd like to try somewhere over here. We'd like to see if we can push over a little bit. Meanwhile, we're also doing this for some other species. We're doing this for different parts of the spectrum, different kinds of laser shred. This, is, uh, this was just the very first proof that this is really a good idea. So we can use this now to measure CO versus, remember, what we want to do is do experiments with the lowest amount of reactants. They're likely to be the cleanest experiments because of uh, contamination for other reactions. Here's an experiment we use acetone, and we watch the formation of CO where the final value is only 10 parts per million. So that's a really, that's, a, that's an impressive result. First highly diluted CO formation. Now we can do this for CO infrared, we could do this in the UV. I think we can probably do this for a lot of different species. The trick right now is how do we do this and get really high temporal resolution because we've got this elliptical pattern. So we've got an idea for that. This is kind of exactly where we are right now in, in using laser absorption uh, in shock tube experiments. Okay, so I guess I have a one line summary. What I hope I've shown you is um, laser absorption is a powerful technique and it's quantitative. That's why I call this lecture series quantitative laser absorption diagnostics.
quantitative laser absorption diagnostics because absorption is quantitative. To do it, you have to understand spectroscopy or at least you, or copy somebody else who's done it for you. You need to know something about broadening and so on. And if you have mixtures, you have to understand where to look so that you can sort out interferences. And then you put it together with the shock tube, which is quantitative for uh, quantitative environment, and you can do quantitative chemistry. So that's why I like to call this quantitative laser absorption diagnostics. Yeah, question. <coughs> Yes, yeah, yep, yep. Am I correct to assume if you, as you increase the molecular weight, you have to have a, high, a higher minimum concentration? Is that okay, and so, so that means I haven't communicated uh, an essential thing. The oscillator shrinks in the UV are bigger than the oscillator shrinks in the IR. It all comes down to oscillator strength. Reactive radical, diatomic radicals have high oscillator strengths, so I put those on a different figure. They depended on their oscillator strengths, which were the largest for CN. So we get much better concentrations for those small molecules because they're radicals and they have big oscillator strengths. You go to the big molecules, which we are detecting in the infrared, they inevitably have smaller oscillator strengths and they're going to have higher detection limits. Exactly what they are depends upon the species and not so much the molecular weight as it is their structure. But generally, the bigger the molecules in terms of the number of atoms, the, um, if you're looking at individual lines, the Boltzmann fractions are going to change. It all comes down to Boltzmann fractions and whether it's a small molecule or a big molecule, discrete or continuous. But I think on that plot, the main thing is one, one of those sets was for electronic transitions and one was row vibrational. That's the most important point. Because they actually had methyl. Methyl was on there, and methyl's pretty good. See, methyl is uh, bigger, but it's, uh, but it's electronic transition, so the detection limit is, is pretty good. Any other questions? Uh, what do you use to make your schematics and illustrations? Are those uh, power trans uh, shapes, or Adobe Illustrator? PowerPoint. You know what I do? I get my student to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason he's asking you, because he might be doing <laughs> that. I spend my time thinking about the problems, which, which mostly have to do with raising money and getting more students. <laughs> yes? Uh, it's still not clear how your gravity enhanced uh, BEAS avoided beam steering. Okay. It doesn't. That's the beauty of it. The beam goes across, and if you were doing a multi pass, conventional multi pass with a white cell, there'd be a little bit of beam steering, and it would accumulate over X passes and not go out the hole. I don't care. I don't care if it moves around. As long as it stays in the cavity, it comes out. So the beam steering doesn't affect me. That's the whole idea. The, the beam, as it moves around on the exit mirror, as long as my collection lens is big enough, I always capture it. All it has to do is stay on my mirror. So that's the really important point. I don't care. It, this is, uh, eliminates the... In, beam steering is still there. But I don't care as long as the light still comes out my, my mirror. Regardless of where it hits on the mirror, 1% comes out. And regardless of where it comes out, I collect all that light onto my detector. So I basically focus the, all the light that comes out of my mirror onto a single point detector. That's, that's, the whole, that's the essence of the idea. And so, because we have tried for years to do multipass, and I could never get a gain of more than, you get a gain of six, and then you, but you lose by, noise would go up by three, and you only win by two. But this way, we gain immediately gained 82. So it's basically noise free so far. Yeah, so that's, that's the key idea. It, it, uh, it uh, eliminates the influence of beam steering by collecting all the light. It still has to come out the window. It's got to come out. But then we collect all of it. If it has to go out a hole, you never get all of that out there. Now we might have tried WMS. I never got that far, but, but I think this is better. Yeah, good. Uh, so in BEAS, uh, is the, are you applying a sawtooth ramp as well? Or is it oh, a good question. So it turns out that the difficulty with CEAS has to do with cavity noise. And so one of the things you do with cavity noise is you make sure the beams do not overlap. So in conventional cavity ring down, they will frequently lock the laser wavelength precisely to the cavity mode structure. And so that's a problem because if there's any change in the cavity length or change in the wavelength, you get some high noise levels. If you're doing cavity ring down, you, you can get around that problem. But in our case, we have to worry about cavity noise, which basically means 
uh, the laser has a uh, single frequency. But that, um, and it's narrow. But the cavity has selected wavelengths which are transmitted. They're called cavity transmission modes. And so uh, if the laser cavity is changing, the transmission of the cavity is changing a lot. And all the noise level goes up. So what you have to do is you quick, we quickly scan across, we didn't tell you this trick, we quickly scan across the laser so it only spins, uh, effectively makes the line width wider. So you have to play some tricks. Otherwise, you can't get rid of this cavity noise problem. So in fact, in the cases I showed you, but we're going to change this, we're actually scanning on and off the line. So we never spend very long on any one wavelength. That's the key. Uh, you have to worry about that aligning, but uh, these are pretty broad, you know, not really. Over the narrow range that we're working, these high, we, we haven't seen a problem with that aligning. But, you know, inevitably, every method has a limit, and you, you push up against the limit. And, and the limit for this right now is um, understanding cavity noise and, and minimizing. But already in this experiment, 82, if we make sure the beams don't overlap, we scan fast enough. So the, what the result of that is that we only get a data point every maybe uh, 10 or 20 microseconds. It's not totally continuous. We'll get around that problem. So uh, it, we're pushing up against this limit, but uh, already we got, if you do it this way, it's like noise free. Yes? Very good question. But I know if you really understand how important this is. We use a CW laser because we want to get as close to real time continuous recording as we can. We want to do microseconds. But there's a reason why we're studying pulse lasers now. That's a, it's kind of a sophisticated, it's a really good question, but I'm not, but for a different reason. You could use pulsed. Everyone to my knowledge that has done this, if you do cavity ring down, you use pulsed. If you do CEAS, we're using CW laser. And I think everybody that I know uses a CW laser. But you can use, you can use pulsed, same concept applies. But now you have to decide, is it, um, how, what's the repetition rate? And so in cavity ring down, you try to resolve individual pulses. You might pulse at a kilohertz, or 10 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz. But all you're doing is resolving the uh, exponential decay for each pulse. We don't want to do that. I want to just look at the absorption. Uh, the question is, uh, what can we gain by using either CW or pulse laser? And that's kind of a research question right now for us. We use the lasers we have. We have CW lasers right now, and that's what we're using. But I'll, if you come back in two years, I'll tell you the answer to your question. <laughs> Any other question before I let you go? Okay, sorry, you're two minutes late. <laughs>